My name is Hind. I'm a professor at Fresno State. Um, how many of you have already run a bottling? Okay, so how many of you stress out before that? So that's for you the most critical time, I guess, in wine making. Why is that? Because kind of you make a good wine, you're very happy with it, but then something happens that you can't somehow control bottling, you can get um, your wine being affected by it. And it's very, very critical because it has a very important impact on consumers in general. So what I'm going to talk today about is total package oxygen, um, how we could manage it uh, throughout bottling. So we conducted a study uh, a year ago, and we try to understand the different steps of uh, the bottling, um, which part of the bottling is most sensitive and which one has the highest impact on how much oxygen we're going to get finally in the bottle. Um, so I, I found this picture very good, and, and I selected on purpose because uh, it's getting a very, it's becoming a very serious business. I mean, total package oxygen is important. Um, well, I found a study recently, um, Wine Intelligence, uh, saying that 55% of the wine consumers in UK are women. And um, most of these women, they prefer white wines and rosé wines. So these wines are very sensitive to oxygen, and we don't really want to care. And we don't want these women to have this feeling when they taste the wine, right? Um, so what we want to control is to basically, we want to make sure that we make good wines. Uh, we don't want heavy have any fault or any, any problem with it. We want to make sure that consumers like it. Um, they're happy when they drink it. And we also want to improve our knowledge. We want to be good winemakers and want to control very well the process. So uh, Stefan talked about this already, and I've been talking about this last year too at Wine Science Forum. And what we know already is that um, total package oxygen has a, an impact on wine quality, uh, wine composition, on the sensory. Um, there are different levels in how sensitive the wines are to this, uh, whether they're whites or reds. And um, especially for wines that have low SO2, uh, Stefan was talking about that, um, well, they're very sensitive, so we, we kind of want to make sure that uh, we control it for those specifically. So what we think are the major sources of oxygen, uh, we're talking about bottling, okay? So here we consider we finish the wine, and we're not going to talk about what happens after this. So what happens in the bottling process from the tank to uh, till we bottle it, so we finish the last bottle. So the bottling tank, obviously, um, Many of you will use different dimensions. Um, they can control headspace while they're bottling or not. Uh, you might use uh, inert gas uh, or not. Um, you can also some, sometimes um, control inerting during the transfer, so inline inerting or during pumping. Um, you can uh, prime with wine before. Uh, you can inert the lines before and, or after bottling. Um, and you can also sometimes inert the filler bowl well, it doesn't happen always, but mostly uh, could be a sensitive step. Uh, filtration um, and the filling itself, okay? So how many valves, how many filling heads, how many corking heads, um, and obviously the head space. So the head space, how you control it. Um, are you inerting the bottles before? Are you inerting after uh, filling it? Uh, so all these could, could have an effect. Obviously the closure, uh, we could think closure have an effect after bottling, but what we're going to see today is also during bottling. So we're going to see that later. So just to summarize a little bit, of, we want to have numbers. So, um, so the total package oxygen, um, as said Stefan previously, is that uh, oxygen that includes dissolved oxygen, so the, the amount of oxygen that's already inside the wine. And we have that headspace oxygen that's in the headspace of the bottle. Um, so some researchers have already set up limits. So for whites, obviously, we have to tolerate less uh, TPO in the bottles because obviously they have less sensitiveness to, uh, more sensitive, and they have less compounds that could react uh, with the oxygen. So we, we might have effects um, um, more visual. Uh, for the reds, we could get limits. So the, the highest level we could tolerate is 1.25, and this is, after bottling immediately, okay? So we, we don't want to have more than that in the wines. 
And we, we see that in whites and roses, it's really low. So if we want these women to be happy, <laughs> we want to make sure that we have less than one milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. Total package oxygen would be ideal. So this is the audit. So we had this, um, uh, we, we've run this last year uh, with Nomacork, and uh, we had some wineries that helped out with this. Uh, so about 17 wineries were involved in this study. Um, we conducted studies where we had runs of eight whites and we had uh, nine reds. So we kind of wanted to see if there is any differences between reds and whites. And we had different bottling units and different dimensions and different volumes that we run. Um, so variation were between eight and 100, 100 uh, heads for the fillers. Um, the speed was also different, depends on the winery, the dimensions of the winery, between 22 and 550 bottles a minute. And obviously you could see the differences in volumes. They could tell how, how much is the, how, how bigger is the winery. So we also wanted to see if there is any closure effect. So we had runs, that, uh, eight runs was, uh, were with uh, natural cork, five used synthetic, uh, mainly Noma cork. Uh, four screw caps and uh, one agglomerated cork. Um, the wineries were different in the way they were proceeding. So there were, whether they were using in, in bottle, uh, uh, inerting bottles or inerting headspace, so inerting system were different. Uh, the only winery we found uh, was not using nitrogen. Uh, so we, we considered it the same, but uh, there were one winery that was using argon, but most of the others were using nitrogen. Uh, so in the bottling tank, um, there was some of the wineries were using uh, nitrogen uh, to inert the headspace while they were bottling, uh, others not. Uh, wine for priming, all of them. So all the wineries were using uh, wine for priming, uh, before, usually before uh, starting. So all of them were using nitrogen before uh, on the line. Uh, some of them were using after. Uh, in the bottles before and post filling, um, not all of them were using liquid nitrogen post-filling, so they were not all inerting the headspace. So they were creating uh, an inert uh, bottle before they fill. And then after that, some of them were adding liquid and some of them not. At capping, um, I, the only ones we've seen using um, a nitrogen uh, post, uh, you, after, they use it, uh, after they put their uh, stopper, uh, they were the ones who were using screw cups. So with screw cups, we've seen them um, adding some uh, inert gas. Uh, we've run also, um, we try to, so this is basically what the, uh, the method was about. So we, what we did is we, we tried to measure um, the, the oxygen uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom valve of the filling tank. So this is the first step. We wanted to see um, how much oxygen um, we could get uh, from the tank. Uh, so expressed in dis dissolved oxygen. Okay, so here we're measuring DO. And we adapted the, um, the inline uh, tool, and that allows us to measure uh, the DO at the exit. What we also did is we sampled at the filler. So what we wanted to draw at the beginning is to see the U curve, uh, or uh, the DO, uh, from the first bottle till the end. So what's the difference in terms of uh, bottling and how it affects bottles throughout the process. So at the filler, we took uh, about 10, 10 samples, 10 points. Um, from one, uh, this is number one is the bottle number one. And then, what is it? And then this is bottle number 50. And then 150, 300, 500. And then we stopped. Uh, we took samples at the middle of the run. And then we took samples when we almost finished. So when the tank was empty and then throughout the finishing, when the, the half the lines were full, till the tool reached the filling ball at the, the last bottle. And each time we were taking uh, replicates, so three bottles each time. We measured DO in all of these. And what we also did is we tried to measure total package oxygen, so including the headspace. So the, what I've showed you previously was only the dissolved oxygen, so in here, uh, we tried to actually measure the total package oxygen. So what we took, we took this piercing device here, the one that um, Stefan talked about previously, and this is allow us, um, it's like adapted with a syringe here, and allow us to measure, uh, we puncture the, the, the stopper, and we can measure the dissolved oxygen in that space. Um, 
we use Nomasense, obviously, for that. Uh, after that, we destroy the bottle and we measure uh, destructively the dissolved oxygen. So how many bottles we were taken uh, in the middle? Uh, we taken the um, same as the number of heads, okay? So, and we try to replicate that, so three times. Um, well, sometimes, obviously, we have more than 16. We can't, uh, I mean, physically, it's hard to get all those uh, bottles sampled, and three times, no winery we're going to accept to give us as much wine. So we kind of gave ourselves a limit to 16 uh, bottles total. So uh, this is what we found. So most of the wineries have, um, so this is the, uh, what we call the U-curve. I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this, but this is how the DO would change from the first bottle to the last bottle throughout the process. If you're very successful in making very, very successful bottling, you shouldn't see this. So you should see very low DOs from the beginning till the end, and you shouldn't have high DOs at the beginning because you're very good. You don't have high DOs in your wine when you finished it. So the ideal is to get as less possible this, D, this U curve, okay? It means that you've really succeeded in controlling all the steps of bottling from the, from the tank till, um, till the last bottle. So this T1 here is actually the first sampling point, which is bottle number one. So as you can see, bottle number one is always the one that has the highest TO in it. Obviously, because at the beginning you have uh, space, you have free uh, air in the, in, the, in the lines, everything is still have air. So if you don't control very well, you're inerting, uh, or you're not inerting very well, you're going to have this very high compared to, let's say, in the middle, uh, bottle number f the, the sampling point number five or number six. And at the end, since you're not having any more wine, obviously, you're going to get more air in your, in your lines, and you get oxygen again, uh, or air. But if you're good, again, you're not going to have high amounts of these. So, but overall, for the 17 wineries, we, we, we've noticed this, this type of uh, shape. Uh, more or less important depends on how much oxygen you start with. So this is the, the most important graph I could show you today. And I'm going to go back to it every time I want to add an information. And as you can see, you have, um, these are all the wineries, OK? So we have uh, not really wineries. There's, we could say the runs, so 18 runs total. And these have different conditions, okay? So different inerting systems, different um, number of heads, different volumes, et cetera. And you can see how different is the uh, uh, total package oxygen in your wine. So this is what you see here is the maximum here, is total package oxygen. So this is how much oxygen you have in your bottle after you finish. Okay, and this is the average of those 16 bottles we took at the middle of the run, times three, obviously. 16, if it's 16. Sometimes we had eight, head, eight heads. Uh, depends on how many heads you have in your uh, filler. So we have variation between uh, 0 0.18 and 1.56 of DO. So you can see different condition can, ha can have a different effect on how much dissolved oxygen you have. Um, and then headspace also different. Um, so between 0 0.29 and 2.33. But what you could notice here is we can, you can see those yellow bars. Um, they're the ones who are driving the total package oxygen. So if you have a total package oxygen that's high, like for example here, 3.31, it's mostly driven by head headspace. Okay, so for exceptions here, okay? So you have these two exceptions. Oh, so maybe this one too, but mostly it's the, uh, the yellow bar who's making your total package oxygen increase. So I, I put this just to summarize. So TPO is mostly affected by headspace. So this is the first thing we can notice. Another thing, so uh, I tried to uh, have a look a little bit more in detail in each of these uh, cases. So these are the wines, um, sorry, I'm not good with this. Um, so these are the, the these are, Example of wineries that have high TPO. So high TPO goes over, over two ppm's. So I'm going to go back to these and talk a little bit more in details about them. And then you have good examples of how, of how they're uh, very successful on managing uh, total, package, uh, total package oxygen, which is here presented by winery number 3, 11, 15, and 16. So these are the ideal. What we could get is low P TPOs, or TPOs at under 1. 
Okay, so remember that 15, 16, 11, and three. And I won't say bad conditions or bad control, maybe. I don't want to say this. Um, but um, so these are the ideal ones. So these are uh, the ones that succeeded. Um, well, let's look at these. I presented in red. Uh, this is uh, in reference. So what you see in red here on the top is red wine. Okay, so these two wineries uh, were bottling red wines. And uh, what they have uh, different is the volume. So you see, obviously, they're not uh, bottling the same volume, not the same speed also, um, but they're using the same cork, uh, natural cork, uh, different number of filler hats. So you see different dimensions. But independent from the dimension, both of them are able to control TPO very well. So what makes them successful? So this is the one that have lowest deal. So the lowest deal we saw in those 17 trials um, was seen in winery number 11. And as you can notice here, it starts always with low DO in the wine. So your level of dissolved oxygen from the tank starts very low. And they're also very successful on keeping it low. So throughout the process, they can keep this level of dissolved oxygen very well. So what they're doing, they're nerding the headspace with nitrogen, so headspace in the tank, so while they're bottling, they keep inerting. So they control uh, uh, with uh, inert gas. Uh, what they also do is they prime with wine. Um, they uh, use nitrogen before the bottling starts um, to inert the lines. And then they also after, they do it after. I'm not going to talk about these because these are having more effect on headspace in general, inerting bottles um, and corking. Um, what this winery here has in, in different is that she has a, a ishi. <laughs> I have the French influence and they tend to <laughs> use she for feminine things. <laughs> okay, so it, um, it's successful at keeping lowest um, headspace oxygen in the bottle, but they're not as, as successful as this winery at preserving DOs, okay? Uh, what they make different compared to this one is they're using positive pressure um, and uh, both of them are va uh, using vacuum for corking. This one is, is working well also with headspace, so they still have low headspace as well. Uh, but this one uh, is more successful in having a lower level of headspace. Um, they inert the bottle, but they, they use less inerting steps compared to the other winery. So in terms of DO, they will have values that uh, ranges around uh, one ppm, but for their headspace, they're really, really uh, working very efficiently. So I'll go and, and, and detail it a little bit one by one. So for DO, I'm going to consider this part mostly uh, for DO, and then I'm going to talk about the headspace and what could affect it. Um, so DO, so these are the two wineries that I told you previously were the ones that uh, were uh, the exceptions. On the, the DO was the reason why they had high TPO. Um, so why they did that, uh, I, will, I will show you later. And then the winery number four and the winery 11 uh, and seven are the ones who had the lowest DO, and I will tell you why. So these are uh, the comparisons. So I've picked examples from those I just previously uh, showed you. And what you see, as I said previously, in reds is always red wines, okay? And these on the right here are white wines. So I try to compare two examples of low and high DOs for reds and whites. Um, and we had different speed. Uh, we have, you, I, I try to see if the hose length has any effect. So I try to present uh, here, you guys, you could see the length of the hosing or the, the lines they were using for bottling. And um, in the next slides, I'll, I'll show you also another graph where you could see, even with higher, um, uh, of higher uh, length, you could get um, not as uh, more effect than in the ones that have low. So this is the winery I just showed you. So the winery number 11 is the winery that have the lowest DO. Uh, the level is about 0 0.18, and this is in the middle of the run, okay? Uh, the numbers here are the ones in the middle because obviously at the beginning you could get higher and then uh, while you're going through the process you get, you get your U-curve decrease in your, your DO. Um, so what's, what, what you could see in here? So these are the green ones. The green ones are the ones that are able to keep a low DO. And the blue ones are the ones that have high DO. So what you could see, this is the, what I call the uh, U-curve. So this is how the DO evolved throughout the process. 
what you could see in both cases is always the concentration of oxygen they were starting with is always low. So it's very important to control the amount of oxygen you start with. So the dissolved oxygen in the, in the tank uh, is very important. What you can also notice is the dimension of the winery. Um, so this is a winery that you, compared to this one is obviously smaller, and this one compared to this one is also smaller. So it's harder somehow to control dissolved oxygen when you work in a smaller winery. Why is that? I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, less care or less sensitive to it? I don't know. Or in the, in the winemaking process itself, the control of oxygen uh, is a little bit harder. Um, but it's very important to have an initial DO which is lower. So the, the most successful wineries are the wineries who start with less DO and who are able also to preserve it throughout the, 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 the bottling. So no euchre. Uh, so low DO is what they have in common. So these are the best ones who have the lowest uh, dissolved oxygen uh, in general. Uh, what they have in common, so you see in the common, always starting with low, and then no U-curve, okay? And all of them they use inerting for their uh, tank. Uh, all of them they proceed with inerting the headspace throughout the bottling. So very important that you guys care about inerting the tanks why are you bottling, if you care about the yield. Um, so some people would ask how to eliminate U-curve. Well, obviously, you can eliminate it if you start with high DO and you don't care. <laughs> so if you don't care and you start with high DO, you always keep it high. But if you care, then you, if you, care, then you have this winery number two, so they start with three ppm. But they make some efforts during the bottling and they make it look like one, okay, but then after the, at the end, they start to care less. Why? Because they don't control the tanks, they don't control the winemaking, and throughout the process of winemaking, there's no really control of oxygen. Uh, this is the ideal case where you start with low and keep it low, okay? So always remember that DO is very important, okay? Uh, it's easier than you could see than headspace to control throughout the bottling. So uh, these are suggestions on how to eliminate U-curve um, or to have a, a better control of DO throughout the bottling. Um, so start with low DOs for sure. Control inerting system, so sometimes it's not efficient enough. Um, and the efficiency, so if you're inerting, make sure that you, you're doing it right. Um, control headspace in the tank. Um, or use wine for priming, obviously, everybody's doing it. Uh, inner the lines before bottling, or sometimes also it's recommended throughout in the line itself, sparging nitrogen while you bottling could help as well. So um, now I'm talking about um, headspace, okay? So just show you the variations between the wineries. Um, but the first thing you could notice here is the bars. So these are the error bars. Uh, these are the, the 16 uh, bottles uh, times three, and you can see there is a big difference among those already. Um, I told you those are reflecting the number of heads you have in your filler. So that means that not all the heads are performing the, right, the same way. So this is very important. So you might think your, head, your filler is working the same but it's not. Uh, whether using vacuum or using inerting or anything, that's not going to be uh, as efficient in all of the valves. Um, so very important this to notice. Um, high standard deviation for some wineries means that um, there is a lot of variation already in the bottling units. And um, so this is just to show you uh, an example here. This is winery number 17, which has a big uh, error bar. And they're still using inerting gas after filling. So after filling, they try to inert the headspace and still not working. So is that really, um, it's, a, it's a real issue. So they're doing that and with that, they still have a high headspace. Um, they're using vacuum at the filling as well and still not as efficient as they think they're doing. So you might think you're doing right the vacuum, or, but some, for some of the heads that might not be uh, the case. Um, 
So filling with vacuum, make sure that all your valves are doing it, um, the vacuum, or if you're dripping with liquid nitrogen, also make sure that's happening in all the, the, the bottles. Uh, this winery here was, was bottling, wine number 13 was bottling a white wine, and uh, they were using uh, gravity. Um, but with that, still, they have also a big variation. So uh, vacuum uh, or gravity for filling, um, I don't know which one for you guys. But uh, apparently, this is not uh, efficient as efficient as for uh, well, using vacuum for filling. So this is another, um, another slide to, just to show you the, the wineries that have high, high um, headspace oxygen. So these are the cases where you see the yellow bar is really high, independently from the difference between the bottles, okay? So these are really uh, not controlling well the headspace oxygen, and this is what drives uh, the total package oxygen to be high. Uh, so we'll try to understand why. Um, what's wrong. So the first thing we notice is the closure effect. Um, clearly, I don't know if you're familiar with PCAs, but I'm just going to guide you here. I draw this line. This is how the headspace is going from low to high. Um, try to gather uh, in, in green the different uh, type of closures. And with screw cups, you see that screw cups is driving headspace to be higher. So higher levels of, of um, headspace oxygen are seen more frequently when you're using screw cup than with um, uh, natural cork or with uh, synthetic. Just going to go ahead and show you this, these two uh, examples of small wineries. Um, and these two examples where we've seen high headspace oxygen, very high levels of headspace oxygen. So winery number one and winery number 10 are both having eight heads, so we might um, eight heads, very slow bottling. Uh, they're both using natural cork, and um, well, the only difference is the the the, the not, um, inerting uh, gas they were using. Um, so they have very high issues with head space. Is that the question? Is that related to uh, maintenance? Is that related to the vacuum efficiency of inerting? Um, know how of bottling in general and how they manage it. Um, I don't know, interruptions, um, so they might interrupt a lot or go in so slowly and so careful that maybe they don't manage very well how they're um, uh, controlling head space. Uh, well, there's an exception though. Winery number 18 was efficient with head space, although it was very uh, a small winery. Um, they have issues with DO though, so <laughs> we can't be perfect. And to summarize, so, um, TPO is very dependent on headspace oxygen, so, so I showed you the graphs. Most of the wineries where they have high TPO, were, that was due to headspace. Um, is that affected by the closure? Uh, obviously, screw cups are harder to control compared to natural or, um, or synthetic cork. The filling itself, um, how the, uh, the, the, the filler uh, or the valves or the filler heads are um, set up or how the maintenance for that is, is done. Uh, vacuum controlling, uh, inerting systems, um, and uh, as Zoran mentioned, so the speed has an effect, especially if you if you're running screw cups. Um, so headspace is harder with screw cups to control. Uh, initial duo in the tank. Uh, start with low ones. Try to keep it and control it throughout the bottling as much as you can. Um, very critical also for small wineries to pay more attention to this. Uh, step, which has an impact on quality. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Ashley. She's not here, Ashley Heise. She was coordinating the trials. She contacted the wineries. Uh, she helped out the students, uh, Bertie Goyard and Pauline, uh, Martina G, my uh, interns. Um, they were working on this um, last year during their internship, and Norma Cork for funding this project, and all the wineries that contributed. That's all I have. Any questions?